Welcome to the IEA's YouTube channel. My name is Mark Lendenning. I'm um, kick-starting the Institute's new cultural affairs unit, and this is the latest episode in our free speech series. It's my great pleasure to be talking today with Paul Embury about his recently published book, Despised, Why the Modern Left Loathes the Working Class. You can see it over my left shoulder. Paul is a firefighter who has served on his trade union's executive committee, and he has been a Labour Party activist for many years. He's also a journalist with, um, who writes for Unheard. Now, we normally associate the uh, neo-McCarthyite phenomenon of cancel culture with the attempt to drive out of public life and employment people said to be allegedly alt-right or feminists who have reservations about the transgender agenda. However, Paul has experienced this form of intolerance as a campaigner of the traditional left, and we will be hearing more about this later. The first question uh, I would like to ask you uh, relates to the fascinating insight you give in the book about the changing nature of left-wing politics and its internal culture. Can you describe for us uh, your experience of this transition as a Labour Party member and prominent trade unionist? Well, thanks, Mark. It's uh, it's good to be with you. Um, yeah, I I think, and I've I've written how um, this phenomenon has has occurred and developed uh, on the left and inside the Labour movement. Um, certainly over the last thirty years, I would say. But there's no question that that has intensified really in the last decade. Um, and I think that where we're heading is to an atmosphere, a climate on the left that says that there is one particular view on a given issue um, and anybody who doesn't subscribe to that, anybody who argues an alternative view um, is somehow to be banished from the, the movement and cannot belong on the, uh, within the movement. Um, and it is incredibly stifling and it's incredibly suffocating. Um, and actually it runs contrary to the, traditions of the left and the labor movement, which is always about openness and open debate and discussion and free speech um, and giving people the opportunity to, to voice their views. And it seems to me now that on the left, we're in a position where people call for diversity in everything but opinion. Um, and people who claim to be tolerant are often anything but, and people who claim to be inclusive are often anything but. Um, and it's no surprise to me that as that culture has started to, to take over the left, the left itself has become obsessed with more fringe middle class issues and has diverted its gaze from the day to day bread and butter issues that affect ordinary working class people. And that in turn, I think, has um, alienated millions of working class voters from the left um, and that we saw in the December 2019 general election where the Labour Party was, was wiped out. And, and that, that cancel culture, the obsession with identity politics, all of that, I think, has contributed to that. Um, unusually nowadays for a person of the left, you attach great significance in the book um, to the value of the traditional family, stable communities, uh, law and order, the beneficial role of religion and patriotism, and you express major concerns about or reservations about the counterculture of the 60s and it's uh, the, the repercussions you see that have followed from that. Um, how would you define the politics you stand for personally and that you would like to see Labour come to represent? Well, I, I would see myself as part of that part of the political spectrum where I think millions of people reside, but have often been completely neglected, where they are to the left on economics. So they want to see a fairer economy. They don't like uh, a galloping gap between rich and poor. 
they want redistribution of wealth. Um, they want a better minimum wage. They want regional inequalities tackled. Um, they want boardroom excesses tackled. All of that kind of stuff, um, which you know, I think has a real resonance among working class communities, and in many many respects, you know, traditional labour territory. Um, but often these people are a bit to the right, if you like, on on culture and on social issues. Um, so, you know, yes, they are patriotic. They do have an affinity for their own nation without feeling any hostility towards other nations. They do often look upon the, the, the family as the, the, the bedrock of society. Um, they do take issues of law and order seriously because working class communities often suffer worse than any other communities when it comes to, to um, the impact of crime. And there was a time where, where being on that part of the political spectrum and, and holding those pretty mainstream views actually um, was not in any way incompatible with being on the left or you know being part of the Labour movement, being a supporter of the Labour Party. Um, but I think as the left itself over recent years has become pretty much an organization, a movement of social activists and students and middle class liberals living in our fashionable cities and has begun, I think, to sneer at some of those traditional working class values and people who live in working class communities. Um, then increasingly those people look at the Labour movement and the Labour Party and say, you don't look like me, you don't sound like me, you're not subject to the same everyday stresses that I am, your priorities are not my priorities, I don't see why I should support for you, uh, support you. Um, so that, that's where I am, I mean I see that as traditional Labour territory, I think that's where millions are, um, but Labour has abandoned that territory and we've seen the results of that. And, and what happens if as an active party member you get up and express these kind of views either in your local branch or maybe at the Labour Party conference. Is there an atmosphere in which you are at least listened to, even if you're in a, a relatively small minority within the party now, or is it something that is seen as almost sort of sacrilegious if you start talking about your, you know, um, your patriotism and your your belief in controlled immigration or whatever it may happen to be. Yeah, the, these are often regarded as, as issues that are almost out of bounds by some people on the left. I mean, they, they when they come up on the doorstep, for example, you know, if you go canvassing in a working class community where these sorts of issues and demands, the, the ones I've just set out, often come up, you will you will often find, I think, Labour activists who stare down at the ground and shuffle their, their feet in embarrassment because it's territory that they're not comfortable with. Um, and they would much rather be talking about some of the, the issues that motivate them, you know, climate change and trans rights and migrant rights and Black Lives Matter. I'm not saying there's not a place for that stuff. What I'm saying is in working class communities, those things are not front and center. The things that are front and center are jobs and law and order and community and, and that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, the, the, the values of many people on the left now, I think, are, are just out of kilter with the values of working class people. I, I think an example of it was when you saw uh, recently Keir Starmer give a, a speech in front of the Union Jack, just positioned behind him. And if you went on to social media and saw the reaction of people on the left, you would think that he's kind of embraced fascism. Um, they were calling him all sorts of names just for, for having his having a speech, um, giving a speech in front of the, the national flag. Shortly after that, actually, I, I spoke to a couple of French journalists and I was telling them about it and they were absolutely flabbergasted. They said it's a perfectly normal thing over here for politicians across the political spectrum to stand in front of the, the French tricolour. Um, and, you know, the, the, the reaction really, I think, just shows how those values have, have diverged so much. I go to the Labour Party conference every year. Um, I had a recount in the book of tell where I was making small talk with an MP and um, she, she said, oh, you're that guy who keeps banging on about working class values. And I sort of said, what of it? And uh, she said, well, if you just mean white people, you should say white people, because they genuinely do believe that when you talk about this stuff and you talk about traditional working class values, you're referring to the, the white working class. Uh, and of course, that's rubbish. You can talk about the tradition. It does say more about them, actually, than it does about you. It, it does say more about them. And, and you know, it, it displays, I think, their own prejudice that they don't believe, for example, that 
uh, as I say in the book, you know, a, a West Indian who came over here in the 50s and worked on London's transport system, or an Asian family who came in the 50s and, and settled in a, an old mill town in Lancashire, that they can't be regarded as part of Britain's traditional working class, whereas, of course, they can. Um, so, so those are a few... I dropped my microphone and just position it again. Those are a few. Hours, don't worry. Those are a few examples, really, of, of how just expressing what are regarded as mainstream views out there in the country and the provinces are regarded as fringe and dangerous views among large parts of the left. I mean, I think I saw an opinion poll um, of Labour Party members about three or four years ago, which showed that something like, you know, forty-five percent of them said they were ashamed to be British, which is, I mean, an astounding percentage of, of, of people in, you know, one of the two big political parties. Uh, and it is sort of very, very bizarre, I think, if you, especially if you come from outside of the left, um, as I do, it's, and, you know, being of the age I am, having grown up with politicians like Peter Shaw and Harold Wilson and, you know, Callaghan and Dennis Healy and people uh, like that who were quintessentially British figures, who were part of the cultural life of this country, made a great contribution to the, to the life of this country politically. And so this, this kind of extraordinary cultural sea change um, is something that I find it very difficult to understand. So even talk I, about the, the, the traditional working class, sort of you, you end up being portrayed as some sort of neo-fascist or something. I mean, I think it's, you, you reeled off some of the, the, the names there of Labour heavyweights in years gone by, uh, many of whom, all of whom, I think the names that you list would, would regard themselves as patriots to their fingertips. Um, you also include people like Tony Benn, who was very much on, uh, on the left, um, but, you know, he was, was in, in no way ashamed of his country, served his country in the, in the Second World War uh, and was, was a proud kind of old English radical. Um, I mean, it, it does make you wonder that if some of these people were around today in the Labour movement, um, how they would be perceived. I mean, you could talk about, you could go back further and talk about people like Clement Attlee, uh, people like Ernest Bevin, uh, again, old fashioned patriots to their fingertips, quite socially conservative on a lot of issues. I suspect they would be seen as, as you know, fash as, as it's called, or alt-right in today's labor movement. And I think that's, that's uh, uh, you know, that shows really how far the movement has, has moved away from, from its roots. And, you know, even any demonstration of support for the nation state is seen as, you know, some sort of virulent nationalism that's, that's sort of rooted in um, the precepts of empire and should be, and should be clamped down upon. Um, but of course, you can believe in the nation state from a democratic point of view. You can believe, as I do, and as I've written in the book, that the nation state is the best form of government at its upper level, the most democratic form of government at its upper level, the one that's proven to have worked best because you know it's built around usually a single political and cultural and economic unit, um, while still believing that you should have close working relationships uh, and cooperation with, with fellow nations. The minute I think you get into supranationalism, the type that we see with the EU and other institutions, uh, I think that's where the, the, the support starts to, to peel away. Um, so these are or should be, you know, just basic principles on the left. And even if people don't agree with them, should accept that they are certainly a legitimate position to hold on the left. But no, as you, as you say, they are rejected wholesale by the left and they're dismissed as, as dangerous. And, you know, it runs the risk of taking us back into the 1930s when people voice this, this sort of stuff. And of course, it's complete nonsense. I'm still uh, trying to recover in my head from... Uh, <laughs> you saying that some on the uh, the new left would think of Harold Wilson or James Callaghan or Barbara Castle as alt right figures, as if they were sort of hanging out with Donald Trump. And yeah, you know, well, he, many, he, of, many, he, many of them, many of them supported Brexit, of course. I mean, the like yes, Barbara, Barbara Castle. Castle and Peter Shaw and yeah. Tony Benn yeah. and Michael Foot. Um, you know. They rather say supported Brexit. Obviously, the word wasn't around at the time. Yeah. But we're, no, we're no supporters of the EU and believe that Britain should be a free and independent nation state. Um, but 
yeah, I mean, they, they, I've no doubt that there would be elements of the Labour movement who would look upon people like that as, as being on the right to that, which is lunacy, absolutely lunacy. Which brings us on to the um, EU issue and your support for Leave. And the first time I uh, came across you was, was hearing you speak in um, Parliament Square uh, to rally in support of honouring a, a democratic uh, result. And, and this uh, resulted in you being removed from the executive of your union. Um, and I was wondering if you could sort of tell us a little bit about that, because having uh, then followed up the story, I just found it sort of extraordinary um, and something that was that is sort of very alarming, um, not just for yourself, but in terms of the way a lot of people on the new left don't seem to now have a fundamental respect for the process of liberal democracy. And you cite a number of examples in your book of people like David Lammy calling people who supported leave Nazis and this kind of thing, or at least the prominent campaigners, I think he was, he was, he was uh, using that language in relation to, which is clearly um, despicable and is not really the sort of language that people conventionally who believe in a pluralistic political system would use against um, legitimate opponents. Where, where is this all coming from? And do you see it as having a, a dangerous kind of trajectory? I think it does. I think there's a view uh, across much of the left um, that they are imbued with the principles of righteousness and decency and tolerance uh, and kindness. Um, and that if people don't subscribe, <clears throat> excuse me, if people don't subscribe to their views, um, then by definition, those people must themselves be reactionary and bigoted and xenophobic. Um, and, you know, that has done so much, I think, to, to drive people away from the left. This, this idea that unless you conform to a, a particular view, then you have no place um, in supporting the left or being part of the left. And you saw that writ large, really in that whole Brexit debate where I think a myth was allowed to, to develop that Remain was the tolerant and decent wing of the, of the debate. And of course, there were many millions of people who voted Remain who, who absolutely were tolerant and, and decent. But equally, there were millions of people who voted Leave who were tolerant and decent. But the, virtually the whole Leave campaign uh, was dismissed as being rooted in bigotry and xenophobia and hatred of Johnny Foreigner and all of that kind of stuff. And the, I, mean, I think one of the talking points of, of modern politics is the way that on the left, um, a position of Euroscepticism, um, which was once mainstream, I mean, we touched on it a moment ago, was, was mainstream on the left. If you look at the common market referendum in 1975, a majority of trade unions supported no huge figures in the, the Labour Party, the Parliamentary Labour Party, uh, campaign for no, the likes, as I've said, of Michael Foote and Tony Benn, Peter Shaw, Michael Foote, uh, uh, sorry, Michael Foote, I said twice, um, but, but people like that, you know, really, really big hitters. Um, nowadays, it's on the left, uh, regarded as a, as a fringe, almost a crackpot position. Um, I mean, the number of Labour MPs who supported Brexit was absolutely tiny, the number of trade unions was fairly small. The further you went down when you got to the rank and file, then the support for, for Leave started to increase. But there's it's it's still a perfectly good sound argument for Euroscepticism from, from a left position. The fact that the EU uh, is uh, an institution that is in favour of market forces and privatisation and austerity and it's anti-democratic um, and is in many ways, uh, it's, it's, its positions, its laws, its directives are inimical to, to the objectives of, of trade unions. Um, but even to voice that debate uh, was, was difficult because people just associated you as, as being part of the, the right wing and, and hating Europe, which is never what, what that was about. So, so that is an indication, I think, of exactly the sort of intolerance that we've talked about there. Is it fair? to say that um, the mainstream left have replaced um, their desire to either eliminate capitalism totally, or at least in the case of democratic socialists, to 
radically modify it with a desire to transform forcibly the culture. I think and, and, where, and, and where is this going? What is the ultimate objective? I, I think there's I think there's certainly an argument to say, which I think links into exactly what you're saying, that, that as the left it's, itself has become more middle class over the years, uh, as it has more embraced the, the, the precepts of globalism and liberal progressivism and cosmopolitanism, um, as it has increasingly become a movement for, for social activists and for students, uh, and as it has increasingly alienated itself from, from those traditional working class communities. So its own priorities are removed from, from the economics of it, so that its own priorities are removed from, if you like, challenging um, the worst aspects of capitalism, if not capitalism itself, um, so they concentrate less and less on the bread and butter issues of jobs and wages and housing uh, and more on the issues that by definition seem to, to motivate students and social activists and middle class people more, such as the issues, as I said, of climate change and trans rights and migrant rights, etc. And I say, look, you know, there's, there's of course a place for, for those issues. I mean, you, it's absolutely right that a mainstream party would want to discuss issues around climate change and trans rights um, and, and migrant rights, etc. But actually, the bread and butter of, has got to be that economic clash. The bread and butter has got to be improving the lot of the, of the working class. Uh, it's got to be about defending people at work. It's got to be about improving wages. It's got to be about building council houses so, so we don't have people on the streets and all of that sort of stuff. Whilst also respecting, you know, with an eye on culture, whilst also respecting that in these communities, there is often a very deep and profound sense of place and sense of belonging. Um, and they don't like rapid and large scale movements of capital and labor, which have got the, the capacity to violate that sense of place and belonging, whether it's through deindustrialization and globalization and solid blue collar jobs being shipped abroad and the gig economy becoming more prevalent in those communities and transient and precarious employment, um, or whether it's rapid and large scale movements of labor, which can cause demographic, demographic change and, and very quick and profound social upheaval and clashes. Um, and, you know, th that, that for me is where the left should be. It should be about absolutely challenging um, the unfairness in the economy, whilst also understanding the politics of belonging and people's sense of place. If I have um, one disagreement with the book, and this may be more a question of semantics, um, you, you'll tell me in a moment whether it, it goes deeper than that. Um, you consistently refer to what I call the new left um, as being liberals. And it seems to me they're fundamentally and self-evidently not liberal. Being permissive about certain freedoms they support is not the same as being consistently liberal. Um, and at the heart of their ideology is the very illiberal idea that society can be divided into oppressors and oppressed, not just people who have different political interests, uh, who are political opponents, but actual oppressors. And I think once you start to see whole categories of people as an oppressive class, which I think is happening particularly in relation uh, to men who are referred to quite casually as the patriarchy uh, by the many on the new left, then you're moving outside of the realms of, of adhering to the rules and the principles of liberal democracy. Because once you start seeing people in those terms, they then become people who should be in some way should have their rights removed or compromised. And this is where I think the, you know, the free speech issue comes in. How, how would you come back on me about that? Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with, with most of it. Um, I mean, it's certainly 
true that I refer to, to them as liberals and to the, the liberal left. Um, I think that is in many cases how they would refer to themselves. Um, I think it's uh, broadly how uh, elements of the media and the movement um, would refer to them. Um, that doesn't mean, of course, that they are particularly liberal. And I think you make a good case, and I wouldn't disagree with it, but actually, in reality, people who call themselves liberal uh, are deeply illiberal uh, on many things. And actually, when it comes to, when it comes to the state imposing restrictions, um, whether it's around the tightening grip of the law over things like free speech uh, and the causing of offence, um, even you could say whether it's over you know, restrictions imposed as part of the recent lockdown, um, it seems to me that the, 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 the left, or certainly large parts of the left, are the first to, to champion those restrictions. The, the liberal left particularly uh, are... are noticeable by their absence and challenging or at least expressing any scepticism over that sort of stuff and, and I think your, your, your point does kind of wander into the whole territory which I think has been incredibly divisive and damaging to the left which is which is its immersion in identity politics um, and this kind of move away from more class-based politics politics and and towards separating people into distinct identity groups according to their particular biological characteristics or their religion or whatever it is and then presenting those characteristics almost as if they're virtuous in and of themselves and worthy of some kind of special treatment um, and actually you know the, 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 the basic the basic premise for anyone on the left should be let's build the maximum unity among people where we can. Um, you know, we, we, we don't want a situation where the working class is fragmented and divided. Um, and that means, for example, whilst I've, I've got a particular view on, on immigration and how it should be managed, I certainly believe that when people come into the country and they're ordinary working migrants, they should be seen as part of the movement and brought into the movement and organized, and hopefully join trade unions and we should stand shoulder to shoulder with them. Um, and it seems to me that there are many people on the left who are actually working hard to build barriers between people and working hard to, to see each other as victims of another group, often comprising working class people themselves. Um, you know, the debate, as you say, the patriarchy. And in fact, that's, I think that's a, a debate relevant to, you know, when we're having this discussion today, um, we've just seen in the news the, the disappearance, sadly, of the, the woman in Clapham, Sarah Everard. And um, there's a whole debate around um, violence on women, understandable, and the, you know, there's talk of a, of a protest taking place. But as part of that debate, some people have been effectively dismissing every man as part of the problem. And you know, as we, there's a planned protest, as far as I know, at the time we're speaking now, there's a planned protest where some people are arguing it should be a, a woman-only protest. Some people have even gone so far as to argue that men should be under curfew from 6 p.m., well, I think including the leader of the, the Welsh Labour Party. Well, that, that, certainly I saw so, uh, uh, someone in the House of Lords in the Green Party say that. And so, so if someone in the, the Labour Party has said it in Wales, I think that's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it seems to me that if you're, if you're and I'm not suggesting the organisers of the campaign are responsible for this, but actually if you're trying to, to build something, if you're trying to, to make a point about a very valid cause, bring people in. You should have men and women standing together. Um, in unity on, on something as important as that. The idea that men are all oppressors who wouldn't understand the campaign and could play no part in it, I think is just absurd. Um, but nonetheless, I think that is probably a follow-on, whether deliberate or not, but a follow-on from the type of politics that's developed on the left, which is, you know, we're all different. We've all got different biological characteristics. We're all part of discrete identity groups. And actually the other people in that other group are largely the problem. And of course, you know, the people at the top of society love that because it means we end up fighting each other. And of course, in a way, it's, it's a very um, trad, far right sort of way of looking at the world in terms of looking at people collectively as part of groups, uh, demonizing entire categories of humanity and attributing negative tendencies to millions of people when only actually tiny numbers of individuals who so happen to come within some theorized social grouping 
have actually committed, you know, serious acts of aggression against other people. But from that, you then extrapolate in the same way the far right uh, have done bizarre and actually very, very dangerous political conclusions. And this is the way I think that, that, that some on the left are going. So I find it sort of ironical that you and others within the left who represent traditional universalist values are being demonized in the way you have been, when actually it's other people who are um, perhaps closer to, to far right doctrine in some uh, respects. I mean, this leads me on to asking you about the labor movement's traditional commitment to freedom of, of, of speech and where you think that originated, where did it come from? And how can that possibly be revived within, within the labor movement? Is it part of the DNA of the labor movement as you see it? I think it is, um, but it's not getting much expression at the moment. I mean, it, it comes from the fact that the labor movement was born um, as, as a, an anti-establishment movement because it recognized that society was fundamentally unfair. Working class people um, didn't get what, what they deserved in, in society. You know, they, they, were, they were often paid poorly. They had to struggle um, in difficult social conditions. Um, and in order to, to challenge the status quo, um, you needed to, to speak out against the establishment in such a way um, where at the time that was quite difficult for, for people to do and was often regarded as, as bordering on sedition in some cases. Um, so there was, you know, the, the, it, was, it was rooted in that, in that principle. I, I, think, I think the truth is, actually, and this may not be a view that, that many people on the left share, but I think because so much of what the cultural side of the liberal left have been demanding over recent decades has been uh, has been absorbed by large parts of the establishment um, I think actually that's that's undeniable when you talk about you know the, the precepts of progressivism liberal cosmopolitanism and globalism etc um, then actually the establishment now believes in much of what the liberal left has traditionally campaigned for so so there isn't necessarily that desire among that element of the left to, to start speaking out in such a way that challenges the establishment. Um, because so much of the political class and the, the media class now are on board with, um, on board with the liberal left. Um, so, so, you know, what, what it means is that the people on the left who are speaking out in a way that challenges the establishment um, are people who come from a more traditional background. So people, for example, who may uh, support Brexit, or people, for example, as you touched on at the beginning of the interview, may you know be patriotic or believe in in the family and believe in law and order, and those sorts of things that are often regarded now as a, as a bit reactionary and, and deriving from bigotry by people who who comprise the um, the establishment in this country and the political and cultural and media elites. Um, so, so that I think is where it's gone wrong and why it's gone wrong. Um, whether it can come back. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, the pendulum always swings back, I think, um, whether it will swing back far enough and when that will happen. I don't know. I, just, yeah, you know, I think there's an awful lot of cowardice, frankly. Um, there are unquestionably larger numbers of people on the left who do believe in some of the stuff that people like me articulate, but they're a little bit wary about saying it um, because they think that they're going to be shot down in flames by other elements, particularly if they hold any sort of position, you know, if they're an official in a trade union, for example. Um, I've been contacted by uh, quite a few people who have read my book, people in the movement, who have kind of said, look, privately, I agree with what, a lot of what you say, privately it articulates the views of many working class people, and we've got to start giving a voice to people like you. Um, it's about really giving encouragement to those people to start speaking up, and, and you never know, we might be able to, to shift the debate again. I mean, in the book, just moving to the, the last question we have time for. Um, you, you say in the book that you're obviously not prepared to give up on Labour, that it's the only viable political force that can bring about the economic and social changes uh, you want to see. But do you think going forward, if the culture war intensifies, if the whole drive against freedom of speech and, and broader cultural freedom gets worse. Can you see 
the possibility of some sort of realignment, not necessarily in terms of formal political party, but in terms of people, as with the Brexit issue, coming together from across party political and ideological lines to fight that issue together? Or do you think that people such as yourself, who are from the left, will have to fight uh, the, the free speech, politically liberal position separately from those of us who are from outside of your tradition? Um, I think that the, the coming together uh, of those alienated millions has, has already actually started to happen, but not in a coordinated way, uh, in quite a, an inchoate way, uh, in quite a way that was almost accidental. And I think Brexit was probably the most obvious manifestation of that. And what I mean by that is, is Brexit was, was delivered really by uh, what I've called an accidental alliance between traditional one-time loyal Labour supporters in, in the working class heartlands, the post-industrial heartlands, you know, the, the people in the North and across the Midlands, etc., cetera, uh, come from very much that working class blue collar background. And on the other hand, the, the kind of small C conservatives in the, in the shires, the more middle class, um, who also feel that their own parties embrace uh, of, of a much more radical liberal agenda has alienated them. And you sort of saw those two groups who have felt neglected and scorned by their respective parties over the years. Um, come together in a way they've never done before and, and deliver um, the earthquake of, of Brexit. Um, and that accidental alliance, I think, is still there. I think it was responsible for the success of the Conservative Party in 2019 uh, at the general election, where millions of working class one-time Labour voters in places that had been Labour since time immemorial suddenly decided to, to vote Conservative, which would have been a taboo for many of them, you know, before. Um, but I think it felt so alienated and so angered by the left, particularly over the Brexit question, that they decided to, to, to vote for the Conservatives. Now, I don't, I don't think those people are necessarily natural Conservative supporters. I think that many of those people would like to vote Labour again because they feel it's their natural party, but just look at it and just don't think it represents them at the moment. I don't see another party coming through. Um, I don't think our system is particularly conducive to, um, to anything other than a, than a two-party system, really. Um, but outside of that, then I think there, there, there is every chance for a political realignment. Um, I think it's already underway, as I say, in an uncoordinated way. And the danger for Labour is that unless it can radically um, reinvent itself um, and return to, to, to its roots in many ways, um, and win back some of those red bull seats, then frankly, it's finished as a serious electrical, electoral force. It will be a permanent party of protest, and we're in danger of a very long spell of conservative rule. That has been entirely self-inflicted. Um, whether Labour has got the ability, uh, the capacity within itself to, to, to undergo that radical change, I genuinely don't know. I hope it does, um, but, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily put money on it. I see talking of realignment that... Um... George Galloway, rather incredibly, um, has announced this week that he'll be voting Conservative in Scotland and that he wants to get Conservative voters to vote Labour in seats where Labour can beat the SNP and he wants Labour supporters to vote Tory like he is doing, where the Conservatives are the main uh, opposition. And I find that quite fascinating that if somebody like George Galloway, on an ad hoc basis, is prepared to jump ship temporarily on a very specific issue, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, in terms of whether Scotland should remain within the union or not, this might start to happen in the context of the culture war debate. Who knows? But I mean, these are early days. Yeah, as you say, this is all very uncoordinated. Uh, Paul, it's been fascinating talking to you. Uh, thank you so much for giving us your time. I think your book is an incredibly important uh, as well as interesting book, regardless of what political perspective one approaches uh, the book from. Um, 
And I think it's always good uh, for the IEA to broaden its horizons and to engage in conversation uh, and debate uh, with people such as yourself from outside of its particular tradition. So I'm very grateful to you for, for giving me your time. Thank Thanks you. For, thanks for the opportunity, Mark. Good talking to you. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. Much enjoyed it. Thank you.